The fourth principle of building your ambition is developing your enterprising skills. Building the skills to be self-enterprising, consistently creating new opportunities, and consistently seizing the opportunities you've created. It means being aware, facing life with your eyes and ears open to the possibilities that may be just around the corner. An enterprising person is one who comes across a pile of scrap metal and sees the potential for a wonderful sculpture. An enterprising person is one who drives through an old, decrepit part of town and envisions a new housing development. An enterprising person is one who sees opportunities in all areas of life. To be enterprising is to keep your eyes open and your mind active. It's about being skilled, confident, creative, and disciplined enough to seize opportunities regardless of the economy. An enterprising mortgage banker will develop creative financing strategies during slow markets. An enterprising lawyer will study new laws and market herself to people who may need help in those areas. An enterprising salesman will research beyond the obvious to find new prospects for his products or services, isolate secondary markets, and develop additional benefits. An enterprising attitude says, find out before action is taken. Do your homework. Do the research. Be prepared. Be resourceful. Do all you can in preparation for what's to come. Think of a few people you know who are enterprising, people in the news, in your office, in your neighborhood. What do these people have in common? They're probably always on the go, developing plans, following them, and reworking them until they fit. They're very resourceful, never letting anything get in their way. They probably don't understand the word, no, when it applies to their visions of the future. When faced with a problem, they'll likely say, let's figure out a way to make it work, instead of, it won't work. You need to be like that pesky little energizer bunny, keep going and going and going. Self-enterprising people always see the future in the present. They will always find a way to take advantage of a situation, not be burdened by it. And self-enterprising people aren't lazy. They don't wait for opportunities to come to them. They go after them. Self-enterprise means always finding a way to keep yourself actively working toward your ambition. Self-enterprise requires two things. Creativity and courage. Creativity to see what's out there and shape it to your advantage to take a different approach, to be different. And what goes hand in hand with the creativity of self-enterprise is the courage to be creative, to see things differently, to go against the crowd, to stand alone if you have to. Activity generally relates to how you feel about yourself, understanding your self-worth, how valuable you are. What could you do if you had all the skills, took the classes, read the books, burned the midnight oil? What could you do? What true value could you develop? This is one of the better exercises. What could I become? What could I really do in the marketplace, in enterprise, at home, in family, in experience, in love, in friendship, in marriage? How valuable could I become? Am I valuable enough to work on what's not working so I can reach my full capacity? If I'm operating at 20%, what could I possibly do with the other 80%? Once you start understanding how valuable you are, it's a whole new experience. Understanding self-worth plays a major role in our ability to be self-enterprising. Our self-worth makes the difference between being lazy and being active, being self-enterprising. If we don't feel good about ourselves, we won't feel good about our lives, and if we don't feel good about our lives, we won't be very interested in looking for opportunities. Being self-enterprising doesn't just relate to the ability to make money, it also means feeling good enough about yourself having great enough self-worth to want to seek advantages and opportunities that will make a difference in the future. Enterprise is always better than ease. Every time we choose to do less than we possibly can, it affects our self-confidence, our self-worth. If we keep doing a little less every day, we are also being a little less. Can you imagine what you'd end up being after 10 years of doing a little less every day? It's devastating. Doing less could ruin your life. Now, you can reverse the process by using your self-direction, self-reliance, and self-discipline. You alter the course by doing a little more each day. Pretty soon, you'll develop a new habit of doing rather than neglecting, and days and weeks and months of doing a little more will ultimately increase your confidence, courage, creativity, and self-worth. In the end, it's how we feel about ourselves that provides us with the increased courage and creativity for self-enterprise. It's how we feel about ourselves that provides the greatest reward from activity and enterprise. 
It's not what we get or what we accumulate that makes us valuable. It's what we become that makes us valuable. Success isn't in the having. Success is in the doing. It's the process of doing that brings value, that transforms our dreams into reality, that converts ideas into actuality. Self-enterprise is found in the activity, for without activity, we'll miss the opportunity. One of the things that most messes with the mind is simply doing less than you can. It causes all kinds of psychic damage. Being less than you can be, trying less than you could try, doing it with less enthusiasm than you could do it, messes with the mind, damages our self-image. Because the minute you turn this around and start extending yourself, you'll see immediate rewards. Maybe not monetary ones yet, but it's how you feel about yourself that's the greatest value. Discover all you can do, see how much you can earn, how much you can share, how much you can start, how much you can finish, how far you can reach, how far you can extend your influence. Some people out there would have us believe that positive affirmation is more important than activity instead of doing something constructive to change our lives. They would have us repeating slogans and canned affirmations like, every day and in every way I'm getting better and better. Well, getting better and better doesn't just happen from wishful thinking. Getting better and better only happens with the discipline of doing better and better. Discipline is the requirement for progress, and affirmations without discipline are, in reality, delusions. Now, don't get me wrong here. There's nothing wrong with affirming the good life as long as we are disciplined enough to take action. Affirmations can be effective as long as we remember two very important rules. Number one, we should never allow affirmation to replace action. Feeling better is no substitute for doing better. And number two, whatever we choose to affirm must be the truth. If the truth happens to be that we're broke, the best affirmation would be to simply say, I'm broke. Face it, accept it be responsible for it, and change it. By admitting that you're broke, by saying it out loud, you'll probably be disgusted enough to start the thinking process on how to change it. Anyone saying, I'm broke, with conviction will most likely be driven from ease interaction. Confronting harsh realities has an incredible effect. Confronting the truth and then applying the discipline to express the truth instead of disguising it inevitably leads to positive change. And reality is always the best beginning. You see, within reality lies the possibility to create our own personal miracle. The power of faith starts with reality. If we can bring ourselves to state the truth about a situation, then, as the saying goes, the truth will set us free. Here's another old saying, faith isn't faith unless it's all you're holding on to. If your life and circumstances have resulted in a situation that is ugly, call it ugly. If you've lost it all, admit that you've lost it all, be responsible to it. And if faith is all you've got left, use it. Create your own personal miracle. Once we understand and accept the truth, the promise of the future is freed from the shackles of deception. Here are some creative techniques that will help keep you on the right track toward that promising future. Remember, creativity is the first requirement for self-enterprise. Number one, think on paper. You can't take a trip to somewhere new without a roadmap. You can't build a house with the plans in your head. You can't build a company with the business plan in your head. You can't seek venture capital with the financials in your head. But here's what you can do. Put it all on paper. When you put it on paper, you can analyze your path, solve your problems, and isolate what works and what doesn't. If you're faced with a mental roadblock, put it all down on paper. What is the problem? State the problem. Write it down. Now, on the other side of the paper, put the answers or the solutions. I've got three questions to ask in order to find the answers. The first question you need to write down is, what can I do? Because you don't want to go any further than that if you can solve it yourself. Then, what can I read? Maybe there's a book on my problem. Somebody spent a lifetime trying to figure out this problem. Maybe it's written out in concise language somewhere. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. And then, who could I ask? Now, guess what you're prepared with when you ask somebody to help you? You've got your working papers to show them. You say, you know, I've got my working papers. I've tried my best to figure it out myself, and that finally left me short. Here are some of the books I've read, I've researched this material, and I'm still short. Now, could I possibly ask you and could you possibly help me? I promise you, 
If you try these ideas and ask these questions when you've got a problem, you'll be able to solve about anything that gets in your way. The second step to keeping yourself on the right track and being self-enterprising is to develop the ability to brainstorm. We hear this term all the time, but what is brainstorming? Just what it sounds like, letting your brain go, being free from all the inhibitions and objections and negatives, just putting an idea into your brain and letting it take off. Free associating, not planning a train of thought, but thinking freely. If you're planning a creative strategy session with your associates, a brainstorming session, let me give you a little hint. Effective brainstorming can only happen if you're free from your ego. You can't be worried about saying something stupid or silly or something totally off the wall, because your silly thought may trigger someone else's brain to take it one step further. Brainstorming in a group is an experience of collective thought, an experience of developing one idea or several ideas through a variety of thought processes. Here's another hint on brainstorming. It can't be effective unless everyone involved is comfortable with each other. If you don't feel comfortable within the group, you may withhold the very thought that provides the solution to the problem, because you don't want to appear stupid. How do you think all the advertisements you see on TV and in the magazines get created? How do you think some of those crazy campaigns are born? The process happens through hours and hours of creative brainstorming and working papers. Every member of the team jots down notes, and one idea builds on another idea, and another, and another, and pretty soon, a campaign is born out of the collective thoughts of the group. I don't believe that the best decisions are made by committee, but great ideas are often created by committee. That's number two to keeping on the track of self-enterprise. Finding answers through brainstorming. Whether you're letting your brain go by itself or whether you're part of a group, brainstorming can often lead you to solutions. Solutions you'd never have thought of if you'd imposed parameters on your thought process. Here's number three for creatively keeping on the track of self-enterprise, and it's really an extension of number two. Number three says, imagine outlandish solutions. Get your brain out of the ruts by considering ideas without considering their practicality. Consider ideas without considering how practical they are. You see, if you allow yourself to think without confinement, you may come across a solution that seems totally inappropriate. But guess what else this type of thinking will do? It'll allow you to open up the process, which will eventually lead to totally appropriate solutions. The fourth creative technique for keeping yourself on the right track to self-enterprise is through flowcharts and doodles and formulas. That's right, doodling, the thing you got in trouble for in grade school, is actually quite stimulating to the brain. Because the way you think while doodling is quite different than the way you think while creating a flowchart or writing a formula. Your doodles may end up looking like some symbol that will trigger your brain to think of an alternative solution. Drawing creative doodles wakes up a different part of your brain. Try creating a flowchart showing the path to success. What does it look like? Is it a straight course? Is it a varied course? Does it have a lot of curves and corners and different angles? Try creating a flowchart to success. It doesn't matter if it ends up being accurate or not. What matters is that it's stimulating the creative thought process. And once you awaken that creative part of you, you'll be amazed at the opportunities that were always there, ones you never saw before. It's all a matter of how you look at life and opportunities. The fifth method of creatively staying on the self-enterprising track is to access the information highway. It's amazing the kind of information that comes across the phone lines these days. With your computer, either your home computer or the one you've got at work, you can go online with hundreds of services. You can access stock quotes, you can access worldwide newspapers, you can do research, you can call up a bulletin board and directly ask questions of other users. You can make new contacts, develop an entirely new network by taking advantage of the electronic age. You can learn more than you could otherwise learn, meet people that you would otherwise never meet, find information that your library may not have, share information, and transfer files that you've never before been able to share. Many people are afraid of their computers. They don't take advantage of all their system has to offer. Work with your computer, find out what types of information and services you can access. Use it as a new resource, a new specialized resource that's yours for the taking. The sixth technique for staying on track, commit yourself to learning. Feed your mind, sharpen your interest in two major subjects, life and people. 
Learn how you can better interact with others. Learn more on how to get the most from life. Learn all that you can so that you can become all that you can become. Learning is the beginning of a life worth living. Learning is the beginning of wealth. Learning is the beginning of happiness. Learning is the beginning of health. Learning is the beginning of spirituality and faith. Learning and searching are where the process of creating your own personal miracle begins. Learning is the beginning of self-enterprise. Now, here are some tips on the second component of self-courage. Ambition requires courage. Ambition requires that you stand up for what's right and fight what's wrong. Ambition requires that you hold on to your values in pursuit of your success. Ambition requires that you fight off fear. Fear is one of those emotions that can stop people dead in their tracks or going success and achievement. Fear can stop people from taking all that life has to offer them. Fear can rear its ugly head in many ways. Remember the old saying, you have nothing to fear but fear itself. You can be afraid of success. You can be afraid of failure. You can be afraid of looking ridiculous. You can be afraid of change, either positive or negative change. You can be afraid of the competition. You can be afraid of loss and destruction. We're not always born with courage. We're not always born with all the fears either. You ever hear of a baby that's afraid of the dark? Of course not. They grew in the dark for nine months. They should be afraid of the light. But do you ever hear of a three or four year old afraid of the dark? All the time, where'd they learn that fear? Who taught them that the dark outside is any different than the dark inside? Where'd they learn that? Well, probably from their parents who decided they needed a nightlight on. The kids probably think that they should be afraid of the dark if their parents insist that a light be kept on. And what about other fears in life? Are they learned? Well, maybe. Maybe some of your fears are brought on by your own experiences, by what someone has told you, by what you've read in the papers. Now, some fears are valid, like walking alone in a bad part of town at two in the morning. If there isn't fear, there's probably a bit of ignorance. And that type of ignorance can easily be solved by either education or experience. Once you learn to avoid that situation, you won't need to live in fear of it. Fears, even the most basic ones, can totally destroy our ambitions. Fear can destroy fortunes. Fear can destroy relationships. Fear, if left unchecked, can destroy our lives. Fear is an enemy. And let me tell you about some of the other enemies we face. Enemies on the inside. One of the enemies that you've got to destroy before it destroys you is indifference. What a tragic disease this is. Ho-hum, let it slide, drifting, drifting away from your ambitions. Here's one problem with drifting. You can't drift your way to the top of the mountain. The next enemy on the inside is indecision. Indecision is called the thief of opportunity, the thief of self-enterprise. It'll steal your chances for a better future. Take a sword to this enemy, indecision. The next enemy on the inside is doubt. Sure, there's room for healthy skepticism. You can't believe everything. But you can't let doubt take over. Doubt the past and doubt the future. Doubt each other and doubt the government and doubt the possibilities and doubt the opportunities and doubt yourself. I'm telling you, it'll destroy your life, destroy your chances, empty your bank account, empty your heart. Doubt is an enemy. Go after it. Get rid of it. The next enemy inside is worry. We've all got to worry some, but don't let it conquer you. Let it alarm you. We've all got to be alarmed, but we don't want to be conquered. Worry is useful only if it asks at three in the morning, your daughter's not home yet. You've got to worry. Step off the curb and one of those zealot taxis is coming. You've got to worry, but you can't let worry loose like a mad dog that drives you into a small corner. Here's what you've got to do with your worries. Drive them into a small corner. Whatever's out to get you, you've got to get it. Whatever's pushing on you, you've got to push back. Illness is another enemy in your life. Illness is constantly testing the outer edges of your health plan, looking for a weak spot. And if illness can find a weak spot, it'll muscle in and take the territory. Unless you've got enough discipline and power to say, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm going to fight illness like an enemy. I'll work on my health plan enough to destroy it. The next enemy inside is over-caution, the timid approach to life. Timidity is not a virtue, it's an illness. And if you let it go and go and go, it'll conquer you, leave you without a promotion. Timid people don't get promoted, they don't advance and grow and become powerful in the marketplace. 
and it's possible to conquer it. Do battle with the enemy, do battle with your fears, do battle, build your courage to fight what's holding you back, keeping you from your ambition. Do battle, have the courage to fight back, be courageous in your life and in your pursuit of what you want and who you want to become. Here are a few techniques to help build your courage. Number one, put all remote possibilities out of your mind. Don't worry about things you have no control over. Don't spend your time thinking about all the bad things that might happen to you. Don't spend your time plotting and planning ways to make sure these things will never happen to you. Courageous people don't worry about the unlikely things out of their control. They concentrate on what they can control. Number two, face your fears. Before you start something, imagine difficult situations before they occur. Make a list of the worst that could happen, and you'll probably see that it's not so bad after all. A friend of mine lost everything a few years back. Home, cars, possessions, antiques, art, jewelry, credit, lost it all. So now, on her way back up, whenever she's faced with a tough decision, she asks herself, what's the worst that can happen? And guess what? She's already been through the worst and survived, so it's not an issue anymore. Now, you don't have to lose everything to lose that particular fear. But what I'm saying is, once you face your fear, you can move on. Once you've itemized out the worst that could possibly happen, you'll see that you have the inner strength to deal with it. And if you've looked at the possibilities beforehand, you'll probably never be faced with the situation at all. Why? Because you've already thought about it. You've already thought it through. And by contemplating what might happen, you'll chart your course to make sure that it doesn't. Once again, it's your choice. Be fueled by your fears or face your fears. It all depends on how you contend with yourself, always afraid of taking the next step. When you plot out your course for success, you know that there will be some touchy moments when fear may get the best of you. To truly change your life, you need ideas. There isn't anything an idea can't change. The major problem is the lack of an idea. At first, I didn't have any money. I said to Mr. Cha, I don't have any money. He said, that's not a problem. Until then, I always thought it was. I was confused. He said, no, no, the problem is the lack of an idea on how to create money and wealth. It isn't lack of money, it's lack of ideas. So if you get the ideas, you can change anything. Now, to get ideas, you need to constantly study and find out. Mr. Schaff also said, when you find out something that works, put the information in your journal. Don't use your head for a filing cabinet. Put it in your journal so that you can do the next best thing. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Go over it, and if you repeat it, sure enough, someday, some mysterious day, the idea takes root, starts to grow, and shows up in your bank account, your dress, your personality, and your lifestyle. Our lives are mostly affected by the way we think. Things are not the way they are, the way we think they are affects us most. Poor thinking habits keep most people poor, not poor working habits. Most people work hard, but they don't think hard. The mind is like a mental factory, and whatever you think about all day long pours ingredients into this mental factory. Can you imagine dumping a barrel of trash into this mental factory every day and coming out with a rich, dynamic, positive life? It can't be done, and you decide what goes into your mental factory. Don't let anybody just dump anything they want into your mental factory, because you've got to live with the results. Starting tomorrow, what are you going to do that'll make a change in your life's direction? Good question. What are you going to do starting tomorrow that'll make a difference? If you don't do something starting tomorrow that'll make a difference, guess what? It's going to be the same. Look at the last five years, because the next five years are going to be like the last five unless you make a change. Tomorrow is choice time. You can do whatever you want. So, what can you do starting tomorrow that'll make a difference? As soon as you plant the garden, the busy bugs and the noxious weeds are out to take it. And you've got to learn not only to nourish your values, but also to do battle with your enemies. Whatever threatens you, threaten it back. Take care of your responsibility, but don't take anything off anybody. If somebody wants to destroy your chances for a good future by their negative talk and negative thinking, putting it all down, I'm telling you, walk away if you have to. Whatever threatens you, threaten it back. Whatever threatens your opportunity, threaten it back. Now, some of our enemies are on the outside. But here's the most important thing to understand. Some of our enemies are on the inside. 
Let me give you a quick list. Indifference. You've got to do battle with your own indifference. All disciplines affect each other. In fact, everything affects everything else. Nothing stands alone. Don't be naive in saying, well, this doesn't matter. I'm telling you, everything matters. There are some things that matter more than others, but there isn't anything that doesn't matter. Here's the problem with the leash neglect. Neglect starts as an infection, and if you don't take care of it, it becomes a disease. And one neglect leads to another. The worst of all, when neglect starts, it diminishes our self-worth, our self-confidence, our self-value. You don't have to go to 29 classes. All you have to do is start the smallest discipline that corresponds to your own philosophy, like, I should, I could, and I will. No longer will I let neglect stack up on me so that I will have the sorry scenario six years from now, giving some excuse instead of celebrating my progress. That's the key to discipline. Let's get kids involved in the least of discipline, one more, and then one more, and then another one, and then another one, and then some more. The first thing you know, you're starting to weave the tapestry of a disciplined life into which you can pour more wisdom, more attitude, more strong feeling, more faith, and more courage. Now you've got something, a vessel in which to put it. The early return will have you so excited, you'll commit yourself to this strategy for the rest of your life. You'll never go back to the old ways. Join a new crowd, join a new group. The disciplines to do, take action. If you'll start this process, the early return will have you so excited, you'll commit yourself to this strategy for the rest of your life. You'll never go back to the old ways. Join a new crowd, join a new group. The least action, the smallest action, take it. Because when you start accomplishing and the value starts to return from that one action, it'll inspire you to do the next one and the next one and the next one. You start walking around the block, it'll inspire you to get an apple, get a book, get a journal, grow, develop some skills. All disciplines affect each other. Every new one affects the rest. The key is to diminish the lack and set up the new. And you've started a whole new life process. Here's the greatest value of discipline. Self-worth, self-esteem. People are teaching self-esteem these days, but they don't connect it to disciplines. The least lack of discipline starts to erode our psyche. One of the greatest temptations is to just ease up a little bit, right? The slightest lack of doing your best starts to erode the psyche. Instead of doing your best, doing just a little less than your best, starts affecting your philosophy. Here's the problem with the least neglect. Neglect starts as an infection, and if you don't take care of it, it becomes a disease. And one neglect leads to another. The worst of all, when neglect starts, it diminishes our self-worth, our self-confidence, our self-value. If you'll change, everything will change for you. You don't have to change the government, you don't have to change prices, you don't have to change taxes, get all that. If you will change, everything will change for you. And the first thing you start changing is your philosophy. You start changing your mind. You start changing how you think. You start picking up new ideas and information, gather new knowledge, make better decisions about what's valuable. And I'm telling you, if you'll do that, your whole life will change. Your health will change, your relationship with your family will change, your ability to cope with challenges and problems will change. Income, promotions, all of it will change. If you won't change, it isn't going to change. You can keep your fingers crossed if you want to and hope things will straighten out. You can wish for the wind not to blow quite as severe, but I'm telling you, wishing for the wind to change in your favor, we call naive at best. Don't do this any longer. Wish for the wisdom to set a better sail, utilize whatever wind that blows to take you wherever you want to go. That is the philosophy I picked up at age 25, and it revolutionized my whole life. And here's what I found. It was easy. I got rich by the time I was 31, and it was easy. My definition of easy, something I could do. I figured if it's something you can do, it's easy. Now, I worked hard at it. I found something I could do, which was easy, but I worked hard at it. I got up early and stayed up late, worked hard for six years. But what I did was easy, meaning it was something I could do. You say, well, Mr. Ron, if it was so easy, how come everybody else around you during that six years, how come they didn't get rich? Here's why, it's easy not to. That's the difference between success and failure. So you've got the choice here today of one of two easies, easy to or easy not to. 
I did not neglect to do the easy things I could do every day for six years. That's the key. I found something easy I could do that led to fortune, and I did not neglect to do it. Major reason for not having everything you want in America. Neglect. Neglect. And here's the problem with neglect. It starts as an infection. And if you don't take care of it, it becomes a disease. One neglect leads to another, leads to another. Pretty soon, neglect has you by the throat, emptying your purse, emptying your heart, emptying all of your chances for equities and power and all the good things. Neglect. What if you should be walking around the block every day for your good health, and you don't? I'm telling you, you're on the wrong track. You should do it, you could do it, you don't do it. That's called formula for disaster. All you've got to do is let that and a few other things accumulate for six years. And now you're driving what you don't want to drive, wearing what you don't want to wear, living where you don't want to live, doing what you don't want to do, maybe having become what you really didn't want to become. That's it. Just neglect. A long drift along, and it's got you by the throat. It'll take all your values, leave you with just a little bit of dust in the summer wind, and it'll soon be gone. I hope I said that well. That's it. That's where I found myself at age 25 until my teacher came along and said, Mr. Ron, up till now, you've messed up. Let's see if we can't clean that up, change it all. I did, changed my life, not just the money, all the rest of the values that came pouring in when I understood that it was me. It was me, so take the easy approach. Getting rich is easy. I teach it to teenagers how to be rich by 40, 35 if you're extra bright. This stuff is not difficult.